March of 2022, like, like just a few months ago, there, there was a, a clip of a conversation that was had on the Senate floor uh, that just went viral. Like, like it just set the internet ablaze, which is shocking because I don't know if you've ever tried to watch C-SPAN for more than three and a half minutes, but it's agonizing. Like, it's like watching paint dry, watching paint dry. So it was just shocking that this conversation went viral. And, and the reason it got virtually wall-to-wall coverage on, on pretty much every news network in the nation is because part of the conversation was so disorienting to so many people that we just had to, to watch it again and again to see if we're actually hearing what we're hearing. So this conversation was had between a Senator Marsha Blackburn and from Tennessee and, and then Supreme Court nominee, now Justice Katanji Jackson. So here's, here's 30 seconds of, of the conversation that was, for me, equally just, just alarming and confusing and, if I'm honest, just heartbreaking. So here's the exchange between Senator Blackburn and Justice Jackson. It's 30 seconds. You can YouTube it later. Not now. I'm preaching. Here's, the, here's what she says. Blackburn said, just listen, can you provide me, nominee Jackson, a definition for the word woman? No, I can't. Blackburn asks, you, you can't? And Jackson says, no, no, not in this context. This is important. I'm not a biologist. So Blackburn, with a confused look, says, okay, the meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition. And, and, and Jackson just kind of dodged and punted. And Now listen, she didn't ask, what's the molecular formula for Clorox or something? She said, hey, What's a woman? Now, there, there are a couple of reasons why this conversation be, should be unbelievably disorienting to you and should be really alarming for us as a church and kind of clue us in to the culture we find ourselves in. Two reasons that this, th- this conversation for me was alarming and confusing and disorienting. First, then you have somebody who now is a part of the highest court in our land who, who is unable or, or unwilling, or both, to weigh in on something as simple as what in the world is a woman. Like, th- that is disorienting. And the second reason is that this exchange, for me, is so unbelievably sad because it peels back the curtain on our culture's steady, and men in some cases rapid, drift, towards sheer and utter madness when it comes to what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman. Like the fact that we're having to have legitimate conversations about should a biological male be able to identify as a female, compete as a female, and dominate in women's sports? Or, or, or should, should a biological male identify as a female and go to the bathroom with my daughters. Now, that's just insanity. Like we're, we're having to wrestle with questions that literally we've never wrestled with before in human history. Here's how Elizabeth Elliot, who was a missionary and theologian, puts it. You should have the quote on the screen here. She says, throughout the millennia, of human history, up until the past two decades or so, listen to this, people just took for granted that the differences between men and women were so obvious as to need no comment. Like, we just got it. They accepted the way things were, but now our easy assumptions have been assailed and confused. We've lost our bearings in a fog of rhetoric about something called equality, so that, she says, I find myself in the now uncomfortable position of having to belabor to educated people with a lot of degrees what was once perfectly obvious to a simple person. So she's going, hey, what in the world, guys? 
Like, it's only in the last 40 or 50 years that we've just started popping crazy pills and are saying some things and doing some things that, that virtually nobody has seriously bucked up against or questioned for thousands of years. So, so listen, man, it is a confused, chaotic mess out there when it comes to masculinity and manhood and femininity and womanhood, and yet, and yet, Acts 17 would tell us that this is the cultural moment in which God Almighty has placed us to bring clarity and hope and a future to a chaotic, dysfunctional mess, that, that we might bring convictional clarity to, to God's good, right, perfect design for manhood and, and womanhood. So, so last week, we looked at God's design for, for manhood, what, what makes a man a man. And so at this week, we're going to look at God's design for women, biblical womanhood. So here's the question we're asking. Like, what is biblical womanhood? Like, what makes a woman a woman? And here's the reason this is so important for us to have this conversation in our day. And we said this last week because what God says about family matters because family matters. It just always had, from the very beginning, the family unit was God's instrument for spreading his domain and dominion to the earth. And our effectiveness to bring about kingdom impact is only as strong as our families. Only as strong as men step into God's role for them as men, women step into God's role for them as women, children as children, parents as parents, singles as singles. So, so this isn't just a few weeks to fill the calendar. Like this is monumentally important stuff. If we've got any shot at making inroads in the lost world around us. So that's the question we're after. What do the scriptures say about the purpose and design and role of women? So man, I'm, I'm just glad you asked that question. Because if you had asked a different question, I'd be in real trouble. So Genesis chapter 1 is where we're going. Genesis chapter 1. Let me show you this. Genesis 1, if you don't have a Bible, it should be a hardback black one somewhere around you. It shouldn't be hard to find. If you're not too familiar with the Bible, just turn a few pages. It'll be right there, Genesis chapter 1. What in the world has God said about what makes a woman a woman? As you're turning there, let me just say, we've got to bust up some ground first so we can speak some truth. Like one of the more insane doctrines that our culture is swimming in right now is that manhood and womanhood are to be understood fundamentally in terms of biology, which is exactly what you saw with Justice Jackson's response, right? She was asked, what's a woman? And what did she say? I don't know. Why? I'm not a what? I'm not a biologist. Now, the reason that's so problematic is because that's an understanding of womanhood that even my nine-year-old can see is crazy. Like, she's a nine-year-old biological female, but she's not a what? She's not a woman. Like, nobody would say that. She's not a woman. She's, she's a biological female. She has biology. But as I watch her live and behave and walk and talk, she's just not a woman. Like, even our secular legal system understands this. My nine-year-old can't vote, thank God. She can't buy bourbon. She can't smoke. She can't drive. Why? Because even our secular courts understand she's not a woman. So there's something other than just biology that makes a boy a man, and, and a, a girl, a woman. So, so there's some type of behavior, some kind of pattern of living, some kind of fundamental something bestowed on a person, male or female, that makes them man or woman, and it's not just biology. And without this piece, here's what you get. You get little boys 
and more developed masculine bodies and little girls in more developed female bodies. So that you've got a generation that is punting on manhood and womanhood until their 30s and they're just little boys who can shave. And they're not stepping into God's role for them as men. Same is true for women. So what in the world does God have for us biblically? Not not biologically, but biblically when it comes to womanhood. That's Genesis chapter 1. We'll start in verse 26. And we'll just kind of read through verse 28 and then stop and chat. Verse 26, 27, 28. Here we go. Then God said, hey, let us make human beings, mankind, in our image, To be like us. They're going to reign over the fish in the sea. They're going to reign over the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals, small animals scurry along the ground. Verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he, he created them, male and female. There it is, male and female. He created them. Verse 28. Then God blessed them, not, not just one of them, but both of them, and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish and the sea, the birds and the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Okay, so since, since this is kind of really part two of last week's sermon on, on manhood, I, I want to show you a couple of things that women and men have in common, have the same, are equal with respect to, based on what we just read. Here's the first one. Women and men have the same maker. They have the same maker. That's verse 26 and 27. Let's read it again because you look confused. Verse 26. Let us make human beings... So that's human beings in our, not just man, not just human beings in our image to be like us. So verse 27, what happened? God created human beings, there it is again, in his own image, there it is again, in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then he blessed them. So so you got man and woman both created in God's image. Well, the Imago Day, if you want a fancy way to say it, the Imago Day, which means that men and women both have equal dignity, equal honor, equal value, equal worth. Women are not superior or inferior to men, despite what's going on in Iran right now. It's just not the way the Bible lays it out. Men, not superior or inferior to women. You've got Equal value, equal dignity, equal worth. And where this gets off the rails is where a culture descends into dishonoring and discriminating against and murdering women like they're doing in Iran right now. So we're looking at the Bible and saying, okay, this is equal value, worth, dignity, same creator, same maker, same image. And, and where that gets punted on, it gets really dark and really messy, and there's a lot of dysfunction and a lot of carnage, and almost always, when men punt on this reality, it's women and children who bear the brunt of it. Where men refuse to treat women with value and dignity and honor and worth, it gets really dark and messy. So so women, like men, are made in God's image, equal value, equal worth, equal dignity, equal honor, no inferiority, superiority, you you saw that, equal. So they have the same maker, but they also have the same mandate. Look at this in verse 28, same mandate. This is what... Verse 28 is what what theologians would call the cultural mandate. God says this in verse 28. God blessed them, male and female, and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, govern it, reign over the fish and the birds and the animals that scurry on the ground. So he says, hey, be fruitful and multiply. Like Fill the earth with my presence as my representative. Create cultivate, bring order to chaos, tend, work, keep, make a lot of babies. But obviously, 
I hope it's obvious. It's going to get awkward if it's not. Obviously, men need women to make that happen. Is that right? Can we, can we, I don't want to get a diagram up here. Not this morning. Men need women to pull this off. Okay, so, so God gives the same mandate. Hey, would you, would you fill the earth, subdue it, reign, govern? Would you extend my presence, my rule, my power, my dominion over creation? But to do that, there are going to have to be some differences between men and women, correct? This is just sixth grade biology. But it's not just biology. It's far more deeper than that. So, so we, men and women have the same maker, same mandate, but there are a couple of differences. That gets us to Genesis chapter 2. So flip with me there. Genesis chapter 2, just one chapter over. We're going to read verses 18 through 23. So, so Genesis chapter 2 is kind of a, a zoomed-in version of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is kind of a 30,000-foot view and Genesis chapter 2 is kind of a retelling, zoomed in a little bit. So here's, here's peeling back the curtain a little bit on what happened in Genesis chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it, it is not good. So, so for the first time in this whole account, there's a, there's a fracture in the rhythm. Something's not good here. Something that, that God created, not good for the man to be alone. So I will make a helper who is just right for him. So if you have a a highlighter or a pencil, just that, that's, a, that's a key phrase to underline or highlight. A helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and the birds, brought them to man to see what he would call them. Man chose a name for each one. He named the livestock and birds and wild animals. But, verse 20, God parades all of the animals in creation before man and, and man Still, verse 20, didn't have a helper who was just right for him. So, the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs, or part of his side, and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God fashioned a woman from the rib. Did you hear that? <laughs> you, should, you should be scratching your head like what in, in his name is going on here. He made a woman from a rib, and he brought her to the man as a bride adorned for her husband. And Adam, when he woke up, after naming animal after animal, nope, 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 sees this one and says, verse 23, at last, like finally, this one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. That's back to same image again. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Okay, so there are a couple of differences I want to show you here between men and women. Here's the first one. Women and men, yes, same maker, same mandate, but we have different roles. Did you see, did you see that? Different roles. So what we saw last week that God's primary design for men is the role of headship. Headship. We didn't use that word, but that's, that's right out of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And when we're talking about headship, here's what we mean. Man's unique leadership in the work of establishing order for human flourishing in God's glory. Did you hear that? So headship is the unique leadership of the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. And I know, man, it's 2022. I know how this is landing. You think, golly, how is it chauvinistic, how misogynistic, how, how out 1950s, leave it to beaver is that? And, and yet, here's 18. You see it twice. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And all the women said yes and amen to that. I can't tell you how many times my wife has gone on a trip, left me by myself, and come back, and there's mold on the carpet, or I've half built a bookshelf, or bought a car, or something crazy. There's nothing more dangerous than a bored man. So it is not good for the man to be alone. So I'm going to make a what? A helper just right for him. And he says it again in verse 20. Look at this. Verse 20. Adam names all the livestock, birds, wild animals, but still there was no what? Help me out here. Helper just right for him. Now, what in the world is a helper? Is it like Santa's helper? 
Or is it like the teacher's helper? What is a helper? Is a hamburger helper? I love hamburger helper. Anyway, a couple things here about this word helper. Here's the first one. The word, for, the word helper here is most often used throughout the Old Testament for how God engages with his people. That's huge for how God engages with his people. Let me give you a couple texts. Exodus 18, verse 4 is what it says. Moses, second son, was named Eliezer, for Moses had said, the God of my ancestors was my helper. He rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. So, so God helper. Deuteronomy 33, Moses said to the tribe of Judah, O Lord, hear the cry of Judah, Bring them together as a people. Give them strength to defend their cause. Help them against their enemies. Psalm 33. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Psalm 146. Joyful are those who have God as their helper. Whose hope is in the Lord their God. Okay, so... So that's the predominant use of the word helper. And, and because that's true, here's what we know. God being called a helper throughout the scriptures does nothing but bring honor and dignity and glory to the position of helper. Not anything less than that. Are you tracking? So the fact that God is, is the helper means that role is full of dignity and worth and value and glory. So, so what does it mean to be a helper? That's the question you should be asking. What we see in virtually every context that this word is used in the scriptures, even how we use it today, is that to be a helper is to be someone who is helping, comes alongside the one with primary responsibility. Headship. You track it? So to be a helper is to be someone who holds, who helps the person who holds the primary responsibility. Perfect illustration, I think, is last week. So last Friday, we had a foster parents night out. It was amazing. Thank you so much for all who helped with that. It was, we had 13 or so kids come and just to see the parents just kind of breathe out for a couple of hours, which is a blessing to me and the people who served. The kids had a lot of fun. But here's what happened. I'm sitting there thinking, what are we going to do with kids for three hours? That's like four days, feels like. So what are we going to do for three hours? So what I wanted to do was do a craft. I don't know how well you know me, but I'm not a craft guy. Don't do crafts. So I'm thinking, I, I want to do craft, something kind of Halloween-y. I can Google it. But man, the Lord has given me a beautiful wife who does crafts a lot with kids. So what I do, I say, hey, Jacqueline, can you help me, help, help me with a craft? Help me put together a craft. If you could do all of it, that'd be great, but I'll do most of it. If you, that won't work out. Just help me with a craft. Now, here's what, here's what I didn't say. I didn't ask and help, hey, would you help me with a craft? I'm not asking her to do my job. I'm saying, hey, I am weak here. I don't have the creativity. I don't have the, the energy. I don't even know I have the grace and patience to do a craft with the kids. I need your help. So, so in me asking for help, needing help, that's not in any way me denigrating or demeaning or diminishing the help. If anything, it's saying, hey, I'm weak, I don't have what it takes, and I need your help to fulfill my responsibility. Right? Are you seeing how that works? So to be a helper is not in any way to be less than, inferior. We've already said God has already established equal value and worth and dignity between men and it's not a question of value, worth, importance, none of that. It's a question of role. And the role that God has ordained for the woman is that of helpmate. Now, this next phrase here, just right for him or just fit for him, you might have corresponding to in verse 18 or verse 20. You might have suitable for. You might have different, different translations of this phrase. But it's not just a helper. It's a helper Fit for him. So this, this little uh, idea of fit for him, suitable for, corresponding to, points us to the idea of not just a headship helpmate, but of a, of a complementarian relationship. Not complement, like looking good, but complement, like we, we fit, we go together. That, that's the idea. Men and women, equal value, dignity, worth, different complementary roles. 
So that's what it means to be just right, to fit. So because of the season we're in, Jacqueline's kind of, she's ready to be done with being pregnant, so she's just doing good to survive the day. So she comes home, wants to put her feet on the couch, yes and amen to that. But it means that I'm doing more of the cooking now in our house, so God help us. So I'm doing more of the cooking, and there's nothing more frustrating, right, than, than, than putting all the energy into cooking and then wrestling the kids to the table and getting through dinner without spanking everybody and then getting everybody out of dinner to bath and then to find the energy to put up the food only to open the cabinet and it looks like Tupperware just threw up all over the place. There is not one match in there. I'll pull out six, eight, ten bowls can't find the lid to save my life. Anybody been there? That's so frustrating to me. It almost fits. If I just like punch it really hard, it'll fit. That's not going to do it though. So I just get to a blind rage and start throwing stuff away. We'll buy some new ones. The idea though is that you eventually find the fit, the match, the top to the bowl. And it fits perfectly. And it clicks. It's all doing its job. It's all working in harmony. And that's a goofy illustration for a glorious reality. That that is God's design for men and women. It's not that the lid is any more important than the bowl, or the bottom is any more important than the lid. Equally important, different roles. Headship, helpmate. Y'all tracking with that? So that different roles, but here, here's what that means. We kind of land the plane here. Men and women, same maker, same mandate, different role, headship helper, but it also means that men and women have different responsibilities. With different roles come different responsibilities. So here's, I want to kind of answer this question as we shut it down. So what? Like, okay, kind of get it. What's, what's the implication? Why does this matter? How does this impact my life in any way? A couple of ways. There are more. I just want to give you a couple. First one is this. Because women and men, but we're talking about women this morning, women have been made in the image of God. First thing, women, single or married, must have high expectations for how men approach them and honor them as sisters. Guys, did you hear that? Women, listen in, single or married, made in the image of God Almighty, must have high expectations for how men approach them, talk to them, treat them as sisters. So l- listen, listen, ladies, do not treat yourself cheaply. And man, I see this all over in my work with college students, young adults. It's just a train wreck. So you are made in the image of God who holds the universe with his little pinky nail. And created galaxy upon galaxy upon galaxy. Who right now, all of creation cries out, holy, holy, holy. You are made, ladies, in that image. Which means you have intrinsic value, intrinsic worth, and you matter. I meet so many women who just... If they could just hear that today would be freed from anxiety and guilt and shame. Man, you matter. You have value. You have worth. You have that because you're made in God's image, independent of some doofus in your life. You have value and worth. So you've got to have high expectations for how you're honored, how you're treated, how you're talked to. And man, you've got to understand, ladies, that your value and worth before God means that you, you have freedom from God Almighty to be quick and easy to show the door to little boys who can shave, who seek sexual pleasure from you without any intention to honor your soul. You've got to be done with that immediately. Put that to death immediately. Here's what I can promise you guys. You bully God's daughters, you take advantage of his daughters, he's just going to light you up. He has zero patience for that. God, help us if there's one thing that I see over and over again with 18, 20, 30-year-olds, especially women and especially guys, 
is the number of little boys who prey on and take advantage of women in the name of a cheap sexual exchange with no intention whatsoever to honor and care and love them. That number is exploding. And the number of men who actually step into God's call on their life as men who honor and treat and value is shrinking like crazy. And we wonder, man, why is the church so weak and crippled? And why when you Google everything, it's sexual this, sexual... We just, we just have an epidemic of confusion and responsibility around stepping into manhood, womanhood. So women, I'm just pleading with you, have high expectations for how I'm going to talk to you, treat you, engage with you, interact with you, husband or not, engaged or not, spouse or not, doesn't matter, high expectations. Second, here's how we'll close. Made in the image of God, high expectations, last point. When it comes to woman's role as helper, women, single or married, women, single or married, must think biblically and embrace that they are God's representatives made in his image and fulfilling his purpose. Let me kind of unpack that. It's a lot of words. Woman, in and of herself, doesn't need a husband to image God. Doesn't need a husband or a girlfriend. Doesn't need any of that. Women don't need any other relationship to fully and completely image God. So whether you're single or married, you just got to put to death that you only have value if, if you are married. You just got to be done with that. No, rather, what we see in the creation story and really all throughout the New Testament is you see women as needed and necessary in the flourishing of the church and the advancement of the gospel. Did you hear that? Women are needed and necessary and indispensable to flourishing of the church, advancement of the kingdom. So yeah, I mean, women, not just essential in the home, but men, essential in the church. So man, I'm just so encouraged by how many godly women God has blessed us with in this place who in a lot of ways shoulder a lot of the load. And at the same time, I'd say, men, what are we doing? Like my prayer is that at every single serve day we have, there'd be way more men than women. Not because women are less. We just talked for 30 minutes about how, but because men, by and large, in the church, have punted on leading the way that God has asked them to lead. So I'm just saying, you've got to have high expectations for how you're viewed, and you can embrace your calling as women who have unique gifts and passions and skills to do things some of us guys can never do, and if you were to do it, it would be an absolute train wreck. So, so you have unique gifts, callings, wirings. So you're, what if you're going, man, what if I'm single? How do I be a helpmate if I'm single? Here's what I'd say. Hey, listen, the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? So, so Christ is risen from the grave. He's doing something through his church, and the invitation is just to get in here. Where the ideal of men leading is lacking, grace always abounds. And yet his invitation to sisters is we want you here. We need you here. We need your gifts, your passions, your skills. Women, you are indispensable, ladies, to what God wants to do in and through his church. Which is why, as we pray through core leader selection, we want to have as many women as men. If God will have us, because we want there to be not just equality in numbers, we want to have matching gifts and skills and passions for, for the health of the church and the glory of God's name. So, so ladies, man, listen, we need you. Thank you for how you selflessly lead, even in ways where God has asked men to. Would you join us in praying? He would stir up in, in men in this room a heart to serve and love, but at the same time, you matter. You have worth. You're valuable. And my prayer is that God would give us create in us a church where men step into manhood and women step into to womanhood for the sake of their own souls, for the sake of this family, and for the sake of the lost in and around us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for hard truths. And yet, thank you for a beautiful design that men and women created in your image, equal in value and worth and importance and dignity and honor, 
have been wired and invited into roles that are just right. Couldn't be any other than that. For their own flourishing and for the sake of the gospel in their homes, in their workplaces, in the city, to the ends of the earth. God, raise up in us men who are hungry to step into biblical manhood and women who are hungry to step into biblical womanhood. Pray for those ladies this morning who are burdened, who are hurting, who are trying to shoulder the weight that you've asked men to shoulder. Pray that your grace might abound in those spaces, that they might look to you as their help and their shield and their rock, and that you might bring a healthy conviction on men in this room who for whatever reason are just struggling to step into the manhood you've asked them to step into. Pray for singles in this room. You might give them rest and peace amidst maybe some frustration, maybe some heartache, maybe some loneliness. Pray that you would pour out your presence on them in a unique way. Pray for wives in this room. Pray for parents, moms in this room. Help us. Help us to become the men and women you've asked us to be for the sake of the family, for the sake of your name and your fame. We love you. We need you. This matters. Help us to live like it matters. Give us grace to do so all the more as we see the day approaching. We love you. It's in your name we ask all these things. Amen.